last week, and we're going to be looking today at the new heavens and the new earth. You know, it's my prayers as we've gone through this series of Revelation, and we've looked at what we call the end of days, that, that you have become more informed of what really God said he would do, and more informed that this is not about just an antichrist, it's not just about wars and all, all kinds of volcanoes and nuclear blasts, it is about God's mercy and God's redemption. This is the culmination of God's redemption for his people, amen? And even in the judgments that we saw, the bowls, the seals, the trumpets, we know that God's mercy is in that, even calling people onto himself. To the very last breath, God continues to call mankind onto himself in order to redeem them. We saw the second coming of Jesus Christ when he comes with us and he defeats those that reject him, those who are murderers, those who are liars, those who uh, do evil and embrace evil things. They come against Jerusalem and one hour Jesus destroys the armies of the earth and we come with him not to fight with him. We just come to go, oh yeah, Jesus, oh yeah, good Jesus, Woo, you know. And guess what? He's going to establish his kingdom on this earth. We said there's going to be a, what's called a marriage supper of the lamb where his redeemed will be dressed in clean white garments and he will wipe all of us clean and we will be completely restored as he said would happen. Last week, if you remember, we took a look at something called the millennium. When Jesus comes at his second coming and defeats the armies of this earth and this earth will be devastated by that time, all life in the ocean will be destroyed. Much of the land will be devastated. We know that from this battle, there'll be many bodies. It says it'll take six months to bury those bodies. We know what Jesus will do from Jerusalem. He will rule and reign on this earth for a thousand years and he will restore the earth. How many people know that? He'll restore it. In fact, we saw that he'll restore it politically. How many people know Jesus' rule will be perfect? You know why? Because men have ulterior and selfish motives. You know what Jesus' motive is? Righteousness. Righteousness. And you see, Jesus is the source of holiness and righteousness. There's not going to be anyone there to play games with him and try to trap him when he does the righteous thing. Amen? You know, not only will there be a political uh, peace, but we said also that what's going to come to this world is a natural peace. It says that the wolf will lay down with the lamb, that natural predators will actually become friends. And it happens not only in the wild, but it says that we will go up to the holy city. And it says that Jesus will counsel the leaders of this earth and he will counsel them in peace. You see, he will teach us directly what a kingdom of peace is all about. How many people can't wait to the reign and rule of Jesus? Amen. You know, with these great and wonderful things, the earth will be restored. But you see, that's it. It'll be restored. But God wants to do so much more. Now, I want to ask you a question. How many people you've been redeemed by Jesus? If you've been redeemed, raise your hand proudly today. Amen. I pray you can raise your hand today. If you've been redeemed, how many people say this is good enough? When I get to heaven, I'll just keep this saggy, gray, wrinkled thing that I keep getting more embarrassed every time I look in the mirror, you know, you know, forget it. I'm not going to the beach anymore. <laughs> right. You know. Or you, how many people can't wait for their new body? I can't wait, you know. <laughs> Drew's got two hands up over there. <laughs> well, understand, the millennium is a time of restoration, sort of like we've had a restoration of God's redemption in our lives. But, but we're going to be looking at the new heavens and the new earth. That's a time of everything being made new. We said that God's going to give us new glorified bodies, Amen. We said that Christ will rule with us directly. We'll have a different relationship with him. We're going to see that today. And that's the age we're going to look at today. Now, I want to do this because I want to give you a glimpse of heaven. Before I share this with you, I got to tell you, do I fully understand all of it and how it works and what it's like? No. Listen to me. I don't understand all the processes of God, but I do know what the promises of God are. Amen. He will fulfill his promises, although I may not fully understand how he's going to do it. Amen. And so as we share this today, I pray that it gives you a glimpse of heaven and it gives you an excitement inside of yourself and it will also put inside of you an endurance to last and, and wait with anticipation for what God is going to do. Well, we know what happens at the millennium. After that thousand year rule of Christ, we know that Satan was sort of locked up in a pit and it says that God for one last time is gonna release him. 
And it says that he is going to deceive one more time the leaders of the nations. I believe these are people who were born during the millennium, who were not redeemed by the blood of Jesus, who will be tricked and fooled, and they will turn against Jesus. And the scripture says Jesus will do that. In a heartbeat, they'll be gone. And he says he will cast the devil into the lake of fire. How many people say, dress lightly, <laughs> right? Into the lake of fire. And it says that those who follow him will be cast into that place. There will be a great judgment of those who refused, those who rejected Christ, and they will be cast into the lake of fire with him. And at the end of a thousand years, after Satan's rebellion fails miserably, this is where we pick up today. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth passed away, and there's no longer any sea. I love that because it says there's a new heaven and a new earth. Now, the word there uh, for new is a really cool word. It's the word kainos. Everyone say kainos. Right? Kainos, it literally means, uh, it literally means a fresh work. Not chronologically new like the next thing in place, but a whole brand new one. Let me give you an idea. During the millennium, Jesus restores the earth. He renovates the earth. But after this, he's going to bring a whole new earth into, into being. Amen? It's a whole new thing. Now, I want you to think about this because it's important. Didn't Jesus say this to us in 2 Corinthians 5.17? This is what the Holy Spirit said to the Apostle Paul. He said, he said, Old things have passed away, and what? All things have become new. Amen? That we are new creations in Christ Jesus. It's the same word, kainos. Now, this is important because it, it says this also in Ephesians. We who were what? Dead in trespasses and sin have now been made what? Alive in Christ Jesus. We say this many times, and I'll say it to you again. Jesus did not die to make bad people good. Jesus died to make dead people alive. Amen? You see, you and I are a new creation, not just a renovation. That God has done something new within us. Our spirits that were dead, that could no longer respond to God, have now been made alive in Him. The things that are, we are waiting on right now is this body and this soul that has been tainted by sin, the old man that fights with the new man. But listen to me, at your salvation, Jesus did something brand new, amen? And in the same way he did that in us, he's going to do it in the earth. And you may say to yourself, why? Well, you know, Romans 1 really helps us with this. How many people know when Adam fell, the earth was cursed? Right? In fact, remember what he says? He says, Adam, from now on, when you work, you're going to work against the thorns and the thistles of the ground. Amen? Ladies, if you love roses, sorry, they're gone, right? Maybe just the thorns. Maybe the bloom will still be there. Who knows? Look what this says here. For creation, on the bottom here, Romans 8, was subject to futility. Not willingly, but because of him, Adam, who subjected it in hope. Because the creation itself also will be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groans and labors with birth pangs until now. This scripture makes it very clear that the earth is fallen because of Adam, not because of anything this earth has done, but because man fell, the earth which had, he had dominion over fell with him. How many people know right now Satan is the prince of the power of the air? The world is under the sway of the wicked one. Amen? And it says that the, the earth labors and groans with birth pangs right now, waiting to be redeemed. You see, just like we're sort of, uh, we become new beings in Christ Jesus, but we're waiting for a new glorified body. We know that the earth will be, will be restored to a certain extent, a great extent, I believe, in the millennium. But God says, you know something, at the end, I'm going to scrap it all and start all over again and bring a whole new earth. New heavens and new earth. Isn't that incredible? In fact, Peter talks about this. I'm sorry, this is 2 Peter 3.10. I apologize, I put the wrong reference there. 2 Peter 3.10. Um, isn't it amazing how one little, one little small one makes a difference, right? The heavens will disappear with a roar. The elements will be dissolved in fire. And the earth and its works will not be found. 
Now, I want you to see this. He's speaking of the new heaven and the new earth. And he said, what kind of people should we be? Why? Because this new heaven and this new earth will have no sin on it or in it. It will not be tainted by sin. And if we want to be part of this new heaven and new earth, we need to be people who deal with our sin issues now. Amen? But I want you to see this because it says, first of all, it's the heavens and the earth. What does he mean by the heavens and the earth? If you look in the Bible, you'll see in 2 Corinthians and other areas that there are what we think, from what the Bible tells us, three heavens that are referred to. The first heaven is what we call the sky and the atmosphere. And how many people know Jesus is going to catch us up in the air? That'll be the first heaven that he catches us up into, right? Then the second heaven that we see referred to in the Old Testament is talking about the celestial bodies. It's talking about outer space. Captain Kirk, da, 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 right? Spock, live long and prosper, right? So that will be the second heaven. But the third heaven is the throne of God. The third heaven is a holy place that has not been marred by sin. Amen? Now, it's only my opinion that I'm giving you right now. And I I want you to know that it's just my opinion. But I believe when he says the heavens and the earth, I believe he's talking about the atmosphere and the celestial bodies. Why? Because I don't think the throne of God needs to be recreated. I believe it's still holy and great and wonderful. It's my opinion makes no difference. But nevertheless, he will create a whole new heaven and a whole new earth. He's going to do it through what? Fire. Fire purifies. Amen? Fire purifies. Now, I want you to see this because a lot of people, it's funny, when I went on the internet, I, I like to find pictures and everything to go with it. I can't tell you how many people quote this verse and they say, oh, it's going to be a nuclear thing and men are going to destroy the world and, and it's going to be this and it's going to be that. Listen, guys, this is after the thousand years of, we read it, right? It's after the thousand years of the millennium. This is not going to, how many people know nuclear, nuclear warheads are going to be planters? You hear what I'm saying? This is to say that they will beat their swords into plowshares. There will be no more weapons of man. This is not going to be something that man causes out of his fallenness. This is not a judgment on men anymore. Men have been judged. This is a new heaven, a new earth, a new creation, a promise given, a promise kept. Just as Jesus said this, unless a seed falls to the ground and dies, it cannot rise again and bear new fruit. Amen. And we know that even all of us, unless we are here when Jesus uh, cracks that sky, we might be, who knows. But if we are not, the natural course of things, how many people know we will die? Right? We will die. You see, there's a portal that all of us go through of where we can do nothing to our, for ourselves. It's a portal we go through that we are helpless. Yet in that, we see God's redemption as he raises us again. Now get this. Paul says we're going to be raised in incorruption. Our bodies are corrupted by sin. He says we will be raised in incorruption. No more sin. He says this body that is mortal that gets sick and it dies will be raised in, get this, immortality. Amen? Haven't you heard that at a funeral? Will be raised in immortality? In the same way that God will do away with these bodies, he will do away with the old earth in order to bring in a new glorified existence for you and me. Guess what? He custom made a garden for Adam and he's custom making a new world for you and me. That's what he's doing. When we are redeemed and there's no more sin, there's no more sorrow. He's redeeming the planet for you and for me. This is really important to understand. This is not an, I don't believe this is mankind. This is not Nostradamus, right? You know what this is? This is God preparing a new heaven and a new earth for all of us. Uh, And it will be something like we have never understood or seen before. You know, if we go on with this, this is what uh, scripture goes on to say is that in it he's going to bring a new life for all of us and I, and I want to explain this to you if I can because I, I thought this was sort of cool now it says that the, you know, the first earth and the heavens passed away and then there's this very odd phrase and there will be no more sea wow and how many people like to go deep sea fishing you go oh come on right I like to go out on the boat, I like to go on my yacht. If you got a yacht, you let me know. I don't have a yacht. I, I, you know, maybe I got a rowboat on Bud Lake. That's my yacht, you know. 
It says there's going to be no more sea. Sort of puzzling to look at. I, in fact, as I looked at it, I wasn't really sure what that exactly meant. And I guess it means there'll be no more sea. How many people know if, if there's nothing that we see that's blaringly obvious, we try to interpret Scripture literally unless there's a reason to interpret it figuratively. Amen? And so we say, why would there be no sea? Well, you, know, you look back and you say, well, we know that the flood, the world was very different. It says in the Bible that there was no rain before the flood. In fact, before the flood, uh, many scientists believe, uh, even those that are secular, that was something called Pangaea. It was one giant continent, right? And so it's possible, I'm not saying it is, it's possible the oceans might have been formed during the time of the great judgment of this earth. How many people know that three quarters of the earth is covered by water? Isn't that amazing? And think about it, all the, all the creatures in the sea will be destroyed during the tribulation. Now, I'm sure it, some things will be restored. There's no doubt about it. But now, this doesn't say that there won't be lakes. In fact, it definitely doesn't say there won't be streams. But it says the sea as we know it will be no more. Well, some people have just offered some suggestions. And they're not bad suggestions. It's just that there's no Bible verse to back it up. Being that the continents are separated by the sea and the nations that rule thereof, with a new uh, order that God brings and the new Jerusalem that we're going to see in just a few minutes, that now there is no separation between the nations and they're, they're, we are all together, possibly. Some people have said, oh my gosh, all the souls that have ever lived and been redeemed, we're going to need ocean space for people. Maybe, I don't know. I don't think God is tied to time and space. How about you? How about that movie a couple years ago where they shrunk the people real small because they were getting overpopulated? Who knows, right? Yeah, I don't know. But, but nevertheless, we're not exactly sure. I, you know, it, it does allude to in the Bible about the sea. Not, the sea itself is not evil. There's nothing wrong. It's not sinful. But it refers to the sea as being a sin. What do I mean by that? In, in, in Psalm 118, it says this, that our sin in our lives is like the tumult of the sea, right? You know what a tumult is in your life, right? Well, everything is all jumbled up and right, sin does that to us. Also, scripture says this, that our sins have been cast into the what? Depths of the sea, right? In fact, how many people know that the beast will rise up, we read it a few weeks ago, out of the sea? And so some people believe that the sea represents maybe sin, and so that might be a reason why, very possibly. But there is something that I found this week that I thought was sort of cool, and I wanted to share this with you. And, and again, it, it's just sort of uh, what I found, and, and if it means anything, fine. If not, curse me, call me Ichabod, and uh, just make sure you leave some money before you go. But nevertheless... I want you to see this. In the book of Ezekiel, chapter 47, it's talking about the millennium. And it's talking about how the earth will be renovated, like we said before. And there's a great body of water in Israel that many of us were able to go and visit. Colleen, you went there. Uh, Dr. Emmanuel, you went there. Diane, Diana, you went there. Hector went there. Rich Sue. Splish, splash, we were taking a bath, right? I mean, we had a great time over at what we call the Dead Sea. It's called the Dead Sea, the Salt Sea. And that sea is being referred to right now. Now, before we read this passage, I want to explain this to you. Our tour guide told us that the Dead Sea is the saltiest body of water in the world. It's also in the lowest, uh, the lowest elevation in the world. It is 1,500 feet below sea level. Isn't that amazing? And, and, and it's in the lowest place of the world. And the Dead Sea, get this, is 33% salinity. In other words, it, it actually is 33% salt and minerals. So one third of that water, when you see it, it's almost thick. If you lay down in it, you're on top of it. You don't go into it. You stand, you lay on top of it. Ruth Martin, you were there, right? You know, in fact, it was really fun because we took all the mud we put all over ourselves. And I was joking with Lee. I said, Lee, except for the heights, next time I ever look anything like you, you know, and we had such a laugh over that. But, you know, the Dead Sea is an amazing place. Next to the Dead Sea is something uh, that we have here in America called Salt Lake, Never heard of Salt Lake before? Now, Salt Lake uh, is another salty body of water, and at its best, it's 13% sal uh, salinity. Isn't that amazing? Only 13%. Think about that. It's only one third as salty as the Dead Sea, yet that's the next saltiest body of water. Both the Dead Sea as well as Salt Lake, how many people know nothing can survive in them? 
Nothing lives in them. There are no fish. There are no plants. It is dead. That's why they call it the Dead Sea. It is filled with so many minerals. Many people believe that the Dead Sea was formed at the time of Sodom and Gomorrah because at the base of the Dead Sea is where Sodom and Gomorrah is. And we know that there were tar pits and that there were sulfur pits. And we believe that the judgment of Sodom and Gomorrah, based on what Ezekiel tells us, before that, it was a beautiful, luscious area. And it has been cursed ever since Sodom and Gomorrah. By the way, the oceans or the sea that we know is, get this, three and a half percent salinity. Now, now we know there's a lot of life in the ocean. It supports life, right? But if you go ahead to the Atlantic Ocean and say, man, am I thirsty? And you fill up your, your, your Avion bottle and go, 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 go. How many people know that? It's not going to work out so good. All right? Yeah. You can't drink the ocean, can you? In fact, you drink the ocean, eventually it'll kill you, won't it? I want you to see this. In the time of the millennium, then he said to me, these waters go out towards the eastern region and go down to Arabah. There's a stream that's going to flow from Jerusalem after Jesus rules over Jerusalem. And it says they will go towards the sea, meaning the Dead Sea, being made to flow into that sea. Look at this. Say this with me. And the waters of the sea will what? Become fresh. Get this, God is going to make that salty body of water, the Dead Sea, a fresh body of water. Isn't that cool? Now that in itself is pretty cool, isn't it? But look what God says the reason for doing this. It will come about that every living creature which swarms in every place where the river goes will what? Live. And there will be very many fish, for these waters go there, and the others become fresh. Say this with me again. So everything will live where the river goes. We see in the time of the millennium, this river that flows from the throne of God in Jerusalem literally will make the salty, bitter waters of, of the Dead Sea fresh again. That which is death today because of the curse, that curse will be lifted, and these fresh waters of God will flow down, and what was dead will become alive alive once again. Amen? And I can't help but wonder when he says that there will be no more sea, what he's talking about is that there's going to be no more bitter waters. There's going to be no more place of death. There's going to be no more place where if you drink it, it's going to kill you. There'll be no more place where anything can be any sign of a curse. In fact, this is what it says in Revelation 22. Uh, we're going to get to this later, but I want to show you this first. He showed me a river of the water of life. Now this river is flowing down from the New Jerusalem. We'll see that in a little while. Coming from the throne of God and of the Lamb. Now get this. this without the sea, it's not a world without water. But understand, it's a, water of, it's a water that flows from God. How many people know when the Israelites were in the desert and they were starving and dying and they were thirsty, God brought water out of a rock. Amen? It says in Corinthians that that rock was Jesus Christ. It was a Christophany. Amen? And guess what? Living waters, Jesus said, will flow from him. He said, we will bubble forth with living waters. Amen? You see, the spirit of the living God will be water for us. Think about this. Bitterness will be lifted. The curse will be lifted. And in this new, uh, this, this new existence of this new earth and this new heaven, it says that there will be no more bitter waters. How many people say praise you, Jesus? I don't know if we can imagine what the world is going to be like without sin. Amen? I can't imagine uh, what it will be like without bitterness, without death. We can't even begin to imagine it. We had a horrible tragedy with one of our friends. Pray for Pastor Ron and, and his wife Mary from Livingston Full Gospel. Their, their little dog went out in the road yesterday and got hit and died. And it was a horrible tragedy. Guess what? It wasn't their fault. The dog somehow got past the gate. It wasn't the driver's fault. He, he, it was Northfield Road in Livingston. If you know that road, he, the dog had no chance. The dog was an innocent thing. It's a horrible tragedy. Listen to me. Those bitter things will happen no more. Amen? Those bitter things will happen no more. You see, it'll be a new existence, a new heaven, a new earth. Like we're going to get new incorruptible bodies. This will be a new and incorruptible world. And it says that the water that flows will bring life to all of us. That water will flow from the throne this new life. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. We read that before. There was no longer any sea. Look, I want you to see what he says here because this is what I want you to grab from this passage. He, he sums this up in verse five. He says this, and he who sits on the throne, say this with me, 
Behold, I am making what? All things new. Now, didn't we say in scripture, it says that old things have passed away and all things have become new. We know that on the cross, Christ has done this for us. But listen to me, it's not just our spirits now. It's going to be the entire world. All things will be made new. Kainos. He's going to make them all new. Isn't that wonderful? You see, it'll be a whole new world that's without sin. In fact, it says this about the, the holy city. It says the gates will always be open. There's no reason to close them. There's no enemy. And it says that nothing unclean will be able to come into those gates. There will be no sin in this world anymore. We will all be redeemed and sin will have been judged. It's also a place where God will dwell with us. Now, I want to spend a moment on this. This is important. How many people know you have the presence of God in you right now? If you're a believer, you have the presence of what? The Holy Spirit. Amen. Jesus said, my spirit I give to you. If you've given your heart to Jesus Christ, you've been blessed with the presence of the Holy Spirit in your life. I encourage you that there are great and wonderful gifts the Holy Spirit gives. And if you have not been baptized in the Holy Spirit, those increasing gifts that I encourage you to seek them because there's great power that God has for you and for me. Amen. But the presence of the Holy Spirit, the Bible says, is a down payment of something that's even greater. How many people know that? We, we saw that a few weeks ago in Ephesians. He's the earnest, the, the down payment of something even greater. And I think we're looking at that greater thing. Look, I, I want you to see this for a moment. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, behold, the tabernacle, that means the dwelling place of God is where? Among men. Now, in the Old Testament, there was a tabernacle, a physical tabernacle, where they made sacrifices constantly, and what was called the Shekinah glory of God would come down. Now, listen to me, the Shekinah glory of God was not God, it was God's glory. Just sort of think it was his aftershave, all right? Nevertheless, it says, and he will dwell among them. Now, get this. We know that he will rule and reign over us, but now he says, I'm going to dwell among you. I'm going to live with you. And it says that, uh, and they shall be his people. God himself will be among them. It says it again. Think about this. God will dwell among us. Guess what? He's the king of kings and the Lord of lords, but you never know. You may look at your next mailbox and it says G-O-D. Amen? You may say, Yahweh Incorporated. I don't know. You may pick up your cell phone. It's going to be God saying, hey, come and take a walk in the park with me today. Just like he did with Adam in the garden, in the cool of the day. See, the whole point is this, is that there will be no more separation between us and God. He, there won't be where God has to be separated because he's holier than we are, because understand we will be redeemed. There will be no more sin in us and we will be able to have the original relationship that God intended to have with us. How will he have with all of us? I don't know, but I believe he will. Because how many people know his Holy Spirit dwells in you? Steve, does his Holy Spirit dwell in you? Amen. Rich, does his Holy Spirit dwell in you? Don't be a wise guy. All right. <laughs> Martin, does his Holy Spirit dwell in you? Amen, right? We see that his Holy Spirit dwells in all of us. We don't understand that, but we know it's true, right? One Holy Spirit of God, yet he's there for all of us. And we see this perfect face-to-face -face relationship with God. He will dwell among us. And look what it says in verse 4. This is beautiful. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. That is sort of cool. It just doesn't say no more crying and no more sorrow. It says that God personally, listen to me, God personally will wipe the tears from your eyes. What a tender, wonderful, personal thing that is. I want you to understand the kind of relationship that you will have with God once again. It's not something we can even fathom in this world right now, is it? It's something we can't understand. I'd like to tell you how it works. I don't know how it works, but I cling to that promise because the word of God is true. Amen? I love what it says here. There'll no longer be any death. We'll live forever the way we were intended to live. Death became because of sin. Amen? So no more sags, no more wrinkles. How many people know that, right? Isn't that wonderful? No more gray. Can't wait for that day. There will be no longer any mourning or crying or pain. Why? Look at this. Because the first things have passed away. What are the first things? That was the sinful earth and sinful man. Man has been judged. Man has been redeemed. And now the world that was affected by sin has passed away. It's all new. God makes all things new. How many people say, wow, what a day that will be? Oh, that reminds me of a song. What a day that will be, remember? When my Jesus I will see, when I look upon his face. 
the one who saved me by his grace, when he takes me by the hand and leads me to the promised land. What a day, a glorious day that will be. You know, a lot of people think that we're going to be up in heaven on a cloud. Listen, guys, guess what? We're going to be on the new earth. Now, I, I do believe there'll probably be some passing back and forth because we're going to see that in a moment. But our existence actually will be on the new earth. Isn't that cool? See, heaven is this, being in the presence of God. Heaven is having a perfect relationship with God. Amen? What an amazing time that's going to be. God will dwell among us. He won't just rule over us. He will dwell among us. And as he walked with Adam in the cool of the day, he desires to have that relationship with us once again. Listen, we have been redeemed and we have been born again. The spirit of the living God is there to minister to you and he will minister to you. But no, God has something even greater than what we have right now planned. Based on what he's given you, that down payment, can you believe him for the full payment coming up? You know, the next thing we're going to see, not only will he dwell with us, but there's going to be true peace here on this earth. How many people say, can't wait for that? Right? We don't have peace today. We have truce. That's what we have. Amen? At best. We don't even have truce most of the time, do we? It's getting worse and worse. We shared before, 500 rockets as of 6 o'clock this morning, over 48 hours, been launched into Israel. Israel has launched a counterattack into Gaza. We know that not only is there military unrest, how many people know there's political unrest? Our country is being torn apart by politics right now. Please don't get caught up in the things of man. Don't be caught up in the spirit of the world. And guess what? You could be on the right side of the aisle, but if you're centering on the things of this world to solve the problems of the world, you've become part of the spirit of the world. Be careful about that, amen? We need to stand up for what is right. You need to vote for what is right. You need to speak your mind. But listen to me, more importantly than anything, we speak it not because of a, some political party. We speak it because God said it's true, right? It's about God's law. It's about God's redemption. And that's what we stand up for. Anyway, I love what this goes on to say. It says, and I saw the holy city, Look what it says here. What does it say? The what? New Jerusalem. Isn't this cool? You know, we got New Jersey, New York, New Jerusalem. Amen? Now, believe me, it's nothing like New Jersey and New York. Believe me, okay? Coming down, where is this coming down out of? Out of heaven. Who's it from? God made ready as a bride adorned for her husband. Now, isn't that funny? Who does the Bible say is the bride of Christ? That's funny, isn't it? How can the city be the bride? We're going to see. Now, this new Jerusalem is something that John didn't see in a vision or think up somewhere. This is a promise from the beginning. And I want you to see in Hebrews, as it talks about Abraham, whom God originally made promises to. Amen? I want you to see what it says. It's by faith, Abraham lived as an alien in the land of promise. Guess this. He never felt comfortable in the promised land. You know why? It goes on to say this. As in a foreign land dwelling in tents with Isaac and Jacob, fellow heirs of the same promise. This is why. For he was looking for the city which has foundations, whose architect and builder is who? God. Now listen to me, Jerusalem was ordained by God, but it was built by men. There's a new Jerusalem coming that will be designed and built by God. Now let's bring this all together. It says in Hebrews chapter 12 that we desire a heavenly country. It says that all these, and it talks about all these people who had great faith, they died in faith never seeing the promise. You know why? They didn't see the new Jerusalem yet but they believed it in faith. And we all desire a heavenly country. There's a new city, Jerusalem. There's a new country, a new heavenly country. It's coming soon. In fact, this is what Jesus said. He said, in my father's house are many what? Mansions. And if this were not so, I would not tell you. But I go to what? prepare the new Jerusalem for you in heaven that where I am, what? You may be also. You see, this promise of the new Jerusalem is all throughout scripture. This promise of this heavenly city and this new heaven and this new earth is all throughout scripture. This is really important for us to understand that there's a place of peace. How many people know Jerusalem is the city of peace? Amen. Has Jerusalem ever seen peace? No. You know why? Jerusalem is a possession 
that is to remind us that we have a heavenly inheritance in heaven. Just like you have the down payment of the Holy Spirit within you to remind you that something greater is waiting for you in the same way the Jewish people in Israel and Jerusalem stands there today to remind us there's a greater promise of a greater inheritance of a heavenly existence with him. Understand the existence of Israel is my guarantee that God will save me. Amen? He'll redeem me. He will raise me again. Now, it goes on to talk about this peace not being a temporary peace, but a permanent peace. Now, the reason I say that, how many people know we get peace from the Holy Spirit? He gives us peace, amen? And my peace is based on what he's done for me. Remember what he's done for me. My peace is based on remembering what he's going to do for me and the Holy Spirit comforting me in that, in that matter. But anyone here ever been robbed of your peace? Oh, it's just me. Okay, don't worry about it. I'm the only unspiritual person here. We all get robbed of our peace, don't we? If you call someone a... Man, you got robbed of your peace. Right? You did. If you look at another Christian and go, how can you be a Christian and do that? Believe me, you are definitely robbed of your peace. And you're robbing someone of their peace right now too. Amen? Don't be a peace robber, by the way. Then one of the seven angels who earlier had the seven bowls full of seven last plagues came and spoke to me saying, come here, I will show you what? The bride, the wife of the lamb. Now get this. He's, who's the lamb? Yeah. And who's the bride? The church. And you know what he shows him? He shows him the new Jerusalem. Isn't that cool? Now I want you to see this description. I, it's too big a passage to read through the whole thing for the little bit of time we have this morning. But I took a few key things out that I wanted you to see. As it describes the New Jerusalem, it says that the New Jerusalem has the glory of God. Her brilliance was like a very costly stone as a stone of crystal clear jasper. Jasper is a diamond in the Bible. That's what it means. Think of this clear diamond. Clear means sinless. Amen? And it says it's a stone of brilliance. Brilliance literally means it illuminates. Now get this. This city is is clear with with purity and it illuminates everything around it isn't that sort of cool now get this we know that we have light bulbs up here we had to replace a few of them at christmas time these stage lights burnt out every couple years i gotta get a scissor lift and i gotta replace those bulbs up over there in fact we know that we get our electricity from uh, from uh, pse and g and you know uh, guess what we're reminded that that's a limited resource because i get a bill every 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 month how about you amen you know, you see, all of our resources are limited. In fact, you say, ah, oh, no, Pastor, solar's not limited. Yes, it is. How many people know that that sun, although it seems unlimited because it's so huge, is in the process of burning out? Now, it may be how long, it may be thousands of years before the fuel is gone, but someone said it is millions of pounds of hydrogen a second are ignited and caught on fire and explode and there's a, there's a nuclear reaction that's happening in the sun that's causing it. And one day, even if it's thousands of years in the future, how many people know even the sun will run out? Now get this. In fact, did anyone ever heard of a black hole? That's a sun that, that, that died. What's really cool here is this is that this brilliance, it says, it comes from God himself. Look at this. I saw no temple in it. Why? God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. You see, we won't need to meet with God in a special place where sacrifices are made. There'll be no more sin and there'll be no more separation. God, we said, will dwell with us. So there's no more temple to meet God at. Guess what? I am out of a job. No more church. You know what I'm trying to say? Because every day will be church. Amen. You're going to see me with a beard and a bottle. And I'll be saying, can we get guys something to spare? <laughs> you know, but nevertheless, look what it goes on to say here. It says, and the city has no need of the sun or of the moon to shine on it. For the glory of God is illuminated and its lamp is the lamb. Listen to me. God is a limitless source of holiness and energy and goodness. And understand that this, even the sun is limited. God's power will become the light light among us. God's glory will become the light among us. The glory of Jesus will illuminate us. The new Jerusalem will be pure light. Isn't that incredible? My gosh, it will be a permanent peace because it is not a limited resource. God's peace will be forever. How many people know we will live eternally? Amen. It's also a place of perfect peace. Let me show you. 
Then one of the seven, oh yeah, I already read that already. Yeah, 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 the other thing. Romans 21, 21, I want you to see this. And the 12 gates, it says that this new Jerusalem has 12 gates around it. In fact, it says there's three gates up here, three gates over here, three gates over here, three gates over here, north, south, east, and west, just like the tabernacle was set up, okay? And it says that the gates were 12 gates pearls of the 12 tribes of Israel. Now get this, to come in or go out, the gate is named over the tribe of Israel and it says it is not like the tribe of Israel or represented the tribe of Israel. It says the gate is the tribe of Israel. How many people know if it wasn't for what God did to the Jewish people, we would never have had a gate of redemption. If it wasn't for the promises to Abraham, we would never have been redeemed. You see, God has a very special place for his people, amen? I, I can't tell you I understand it. Now, don't worry, because we're going to start looking here. Look, it goes on to say this. The material of the wall was jasper. That's a diamond again. And the city was pure gold, like clear glass. That's amazing. Gold is, is, is royal, right? Remember we said that Jesus said, in my house are many mansions. The whole idea of a mansion is not, is, it could be about the size, but it's more about the opulence. You see, it'll be a great and glorious place, amen? And it'll be a place of God's glory. It'll be pure like gold. It'll be clear, that gold. I, anyone has seen any clear gold lately? Now, I saw in Star Trek transparent aluminum. That's the best we can think up, amen? But I've never seen clear gold. It's gonna be an amazing thing for us to see. Now, look what it goes on here. It says, the 12 foundation stones of the 12 apostles. The 12 apostles are the beginning of the church. They represent all of us who have been saved. Amen. It goes on to say this, of the city wall were adorned with every kind of precious stone. It names 12 precious stones. And eight of those 12 were from the aphod of the high priest. Because what are we going to do all the time? We're going to worship and serve him. Now, I don't know how this works, but you know something? We're not in the city. Listen, guys, we are the city. Let me say that again. We're not just in the city. We are the city. Scripture refers to us like being precious gems. Scripture refers to the, to the nation of Israel as being the gateway that comes in. I want you to think of a pearl for a moment. It's our time. Oh, gosh, our time's behind us already. Forget about it. No, now, now you're going to say, what was he going to say about the pearl? Okay. All right. I got you. <laughs> Anyone know how a pearl is formed? An oyster in the water, piece of sand or something irritating gets in the oyster. Anyone who gets a little piece of sand, something irritating in your life, right? And the oyster, what it does, it starts to excrete this, this stuff that starts to coat that, that sand and it makes it smooth and it gets larger. And uh, eventually when people go down and get pearls, it, it originally was a sand that was an irritant, but it becomes this beautiful, priceless, beautiful, I don't want to call it a gem, but it's like a gem, right? Think about this. For how many years was Israel unfaithful to God? For how many years has Israel been persecuted? How many troubles has Israel gone through? Yet in the end, all those irritations will have come to a place where a perfect gem has, of great value has been formed. You know, the same thing in your life and mine. Where are the areas of your life where you've had irritations? You know God's going to turn into a pearl for you. Amen? If you allow the oil of the Holy Spirit to flow in your life, God can turn it into a pearl. Amen? He'll make it something beautiful. He can give you beauty for ashes. I love it. The, the city wall was adorned with every kind of precious stone. Guys, we're not just in the city. We are the city. Now, I don't know how that works. I don't know what it's like. Like I told you, I understand the promises of God and I cling to them, but I don't understand the processes of God. Now, my first thing when I read that, I said, oh my gosh, it's be like Pirates of the Caribbean, those guys become part of the ship. I don't think so. We're not going to become inanimate. But understand, how many we said before, we are the ecclesia, we are the called out ones. The church is not this building. The church is us. Amen? And the holy city is representative of God's people. If you notice, 12 uh, gates. We saw 12 foundations. We know that it's 12,000 furlongs long, which is about 13,000 miles. Now get this, 12, 12, 12. And then it also says that the gates are 144 cubits high. A cubit is about 18 inches, remember Noah? But guess what, 144 is 12 times 12. Now, we said this. That the twelve, uh, tri the tw 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 that's all, folks. The twelve represents the tribes of Israel. Those were the people who were redeemed by God. 
And also we said the 12 represent the apostles, the church that's been redeemed by God. Both Israel and the church have been redeemed by God. The number 12 is the number of the redeemed, amen? And that's why we see 12, 12, 12, 12, because God has redeemed his people and the new Jerusalem is all about redemption, peace, perfect peace, permanent peace, and eternal peace. Amen? What a day that is going to be. And we're almost done for the day. Then he showed me a river of the water of life. We read this before. As crystal coming from the throne of God and of the Lamb. And in the middle of its street, on either side, the river was a what? Now, where did you last see the tree of life? In the Garden of Eden, right? In fact, I call it the Garden of Eden. <laughs> right? We know Adam ate of the knowledge of the fruit of the tree of good and evil. And what did God say about the tree of life? He had to kick Adam and Eve out because he said, lest they eat of the tree of life and what? Live forever. Now, where does this tree of life pop back up? In the new heaven and the new earth where there is no more curse, amen? And look what it says here. Bearing 12 kinds of fruit, 12 again. The 12 apostles, the redeemed of God, 12, the 12 tribes, the redeemed of Israel, yielding its fruit every month in a regular way. And get this, and the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. Now, I read that and said to myself, well, what do they need to be healed of? That Didn't that happen in the millennium? So I looked at the original word. You know what the original word there in the original language is? I love this, for the nutrition of the nations. Now, isn't that cool? Jesus said, unless they eat of the tree of life and live forever. Listen to me. God, after he redeems us, we will all eat of the tree of life and live forever. That will be our nutrition. Now, I don't know what kind of fruit it's going to be, but I'm sure it's going to taste awful good. Amen? I'm sure it's something we're going to like every day. I know that God gave Israelites manna in heaven for 40 years, yet we're going to get the, 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 uh, from this tree forever. It will be our nutrition. Get this. The water that we need to survive will come from God, and, the, and what will grow from that water will be a tree of life that will nourish each and every one of us. That's why there's no need for a sea anymore. There may be lakes or streams or rivers, but guess what? We will get our life directly from God. Amen? No longer will there be any curse. The throne of God and the Lamb will be in it. I love that. His bond servants, that's us, will serve Him. And they will see His face. That will be a face-to-face -face relationship with Him. And His name will be written where? Bum, bum, bum. Remember we said to you before, everyone says, don't get the sign of the beast. Listen to me, if, you, if you've got God written on your forehead, you don't have to worry about the sign of the beast, amen? You make sure that your name is written and God's name is written on you. That means he is ours and we are his, amen? Wow, what an existence. It will be an eternal peace. You know, and as we close this morning, I want to ask you a question. Is this your inheritance? It, will this be your inheritance? I share this with you today, and I know a lot of revelation is very informational because it hasn't happened yet. But we need to know. Scripture says, blessed are those who read this book and heed what's in this book. Amen? I wanted you to know. Frankly, I wanted to know. As I studied this, I found a few misnomers that I had until I read it right out of the book. How about you? Oh, the late great planet Earth is a great movie. And the Left Behind series is a great movie. But listen to me. Don't let those become your theology. Let Revelation read the book. Amen? You know why most of us don't go to Revelation? Because we listen to other people. I, I can't tell you how many times I tried to study Revelation. I, 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 I can name names to you. I don't want to name anyone. But they have this, that. They got all these lines connected to this. And I get, because I can't figure it out because they, they're just they're too smart for me. Listen to me. You don't have to be brilliant to read the book and see God's mercy, to see his judgment, to see the fact he wants to redeem his people. Read the book for yourself. Amen? Is it your inheritance? This is what God says. After the new heaven and the new earth is formed, he says, it is done. Who said that once before? Jesus on the cross. He will make sight what is faith for all of us. That heavenly city will be here and that new relationship will be here. Our incorruptible bodies will be here. It'll be a whole different existence. And he says this, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. God was there from the beginning. He's there to the end and he's everything in between. How many people know that?
And with God there is no end. And I will give to the one who thirsts from the spring of water of life. What's that say? Without cost. We just saw that in Psalm 55. Listen to me. He has nourishment, spiritual nourishment for you today. All you need to do is tap into him. And for an eternity and a lifetime, he is there to feed and nourish all of us. And I love this right now. And this is what we're closing with today. Jen, if you'd come forward. He who overcomes. How many people are you struggling with the world right now? You struggle with what's going on in the world right now. You're saying, man, I just want to get through this. Man, it makes me angry. It makes me bitter. Some people may say, I've fallen and I've goofed up and I've made a mess and the world has sinned against me and I have sinned in this world. And God says, he who overcomes will what? Inherit these things. You see, I share this message with you today because I want for you to have a glimpse of glory of what your future is. You have a future and a hope in Jesus Christ. Amen? Don't let the world rob you and tell you something otherwise. Don't let some sickness tell you otherwise. Don't let some person in this world who thinks they're real clever and smart and philosophical tell you otherwise. Jesus has a future and a hope plan for all of us. And the question is, is it your inheritance today? Do you believe the promises that he's given to you? Have you clung to the cross where Jesus made a sacrifice for you and said, Lord, go before me, Lord. You are my salvation. Are you trusting him by obeying him and showing that you believe in him? He said, I will be his God and they will be my sons. I want you to know there's a relationship that's coming with God for you. Do not lose heart right now. I believe this with all of my heart, do you? Peter says this as we close. He said that there'll be a new heaven and a new earth that they'll melt with fervent heat. And he says this, what kind of people should we be? That's what he says. As we see the promise of a new heaven and a new earth, a new existence with God, a sinless existence on a sinless world in an incredible city where God is our neighbor. God dwells with us and we have a perfect relationship. I've shared this with you before. Think of a, when you fell in love with someone and think of how every day you couldn't wait to spend time with them. Every day was exciting. Times that by a thousand and that's a relationship with Jesus Christ. Amen? Every day will be that. Yet Revelation says this, will this be your inheritance? We may have a lot of problems until then. A number of setbacks. Plenty of questions. But in that, will you hold on to God's promises for you? And if there's anyone here this morning, maybe you say, I need to know Jesus. I want to make sure that promise is for me. It's a very simple thing. All you need to do is say, Jesus, come into my life. Jesus, I trust you as my Savior. Jesus, I give my heart to you. Jesus, save me. And we know that you'll become one of his. If you prayed that, you're part of the kingdom of God. You're part of the family of God this morning. Jesus, I just pray for all of my friends that are here right now, Lord God. Many of us have physical issues that we're trying to work through. Many of us have relationship issues that we're trying to work through. Lord, many of us have, we see the politics of the day, the morality of the day that we're trying to work through, Lord God. Many of us are just trying to hold our families together. Many of us have lost our families, Lord God. Lord, many of us see those around us, Lord God, that are enemies of the cross. And Lord, we, we say, Lord God, we, we just want to endure, Lord. And Jesus, we know that we will because your spirit is with each and every one of us, Lord God. Father, I pray that you would encourage your people today that you are there. Your rod and your staff is there to comfort them. You prepare a table before them in the presence of their enemies, Lord God. You lead them beside the still water. Oh, Jesus, you bring them into green pastures. Lord, each and every one of us have a promise for you. And Lord, we ask you now, Lord, give us through your spirit the endurance we need to see this through. I'd ask you to pray for one more thing. We're done this morning. I want you to pray for someone that you know this is not their inheritance. That they won't see this if things keep going the way they go in their life. Would you lift them up by name before Jesus right now? I'm sure everyone of us knows someone who's not redeemed. 
Would you just close your eyes and name their name before Jesus and begin to intercede for their life right now? Because if Revelation doesn't give us anything, it should give us a burden for souls right now. Oh, Jesus, I pray for those that we know, Lord God, who don't know you, whether they be family or neighbors or community members, Lord, whether they be people we work with or go to school with, Lord God, they don't know you. And Lord, that their end, Lord God, is not a good one. And Jesus, through your bittersweet plan, we don't want for them to taste the bitterness. We want for them to taste the sweetness, Lord God. Bring them into the inheritance that you have for them, Lord God, through faith, Lord Jesus, that they would find your, your redemption, Lord, the blood that you shed on Calvary, Lord God, and Father, they would get saved. We bless you this morning, and we thank you, and we ask these things in Jesus' name. God, people said, amen.